Atong ano, review na lang. Mo? Oh, okay, sige. So, good afternoon everyone. Mas share your screen yan ako. This one. Nakikita niyo, mga dog? <coughs> yes, po, yes dog. po. Yes po, dog. Okay, so... Okay na yan. Okay. So, good afternoon everyone. I am postgraduate intern Ina Hite and this afternoon I was tasked to to discuss to you <coughs> um, hemostasis, surgical bleeding and transfusion. Actually, this is chapter 4 of your um, surgery textbook, the Schwartz Principles of Surgery. So, <clears throat> um, in this presentation, um, it is not actually, everything is um, <clears throat> not actually included then and then. So, you can always um, read on sa chapter 4. That's 11th edition of your textbook. So, this afternoon, our topic is hemostasis, surgical bleeding, and transfusion. <clears throat> Excuse me. So, the contents of our discussion include the biology of hemostasis. That will include the vasoconstriction, platelet function, coagulation, and fibrinolysis. So, in the second part, we have tests for hemostasis and coagulation. Actually, we will discuss this very briefly lang or in passing because um, good to know lang so that you will be familiar with the tests. The third part is disorders of hemostasis. Um, actually, this one, this part is very lengthy in your textbook, so you can <clears throat> read na lang also in details. But we'll be, um, I will be stating um, examples of your plated disorders, coagulation factor uh, deficiencies, and other diseases. Okay, so fourth part is the transfusion. It's actually also lengthy in the textbook, but you can always um, scan through the, the book. So that's Swartz uh, 11th edition. If you don't have a copy of the book, I can send you a copy if wala. So let's start with the biology of hemostasis. In the textbook, hemostasis is defined as a complex process whose function is to limit blood loss from an injured vessel. So basically, no, um, the function of hemostasis is to, to restore balance again. No? So your body has a way of um, preventing further damage or further loss of blood from the vessels, especially from the vessels. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> excuse me. So there are four physiologic processes that interrelate to limit blood loss. First, we have vasoconstriction. So vasoconstriction is actually the first one, but it is not um, powerful enough to prevent blood loss, diba? But it is the initial na, uh, mechanism to prevent further blood loss or to repair um, damage to vessels. Next one is platelet plug formation. So we are very familiar with this. That's why we have to familiar, familiarize ourselves with the function of the platelets. Okay. Next is coagulation. So that's clotting, diba? And then also fibrinolysis. So you have to be familiar um, what is the end result of, say, for example, fibrinolysis. So you have to, to be familiar with the the function of your fibrin also because it will be in opposite no, to the previously na mentioned na mechanisms. 
So we go first to vasoconstriction. <clears throat> I'm sorry. So vascular constriction is the initial response to injury. And you have to be also familiar with the substances that can induce vasoconstriction. We have your thromboxin A2, your endothelin, serotonin, radicanin, and fibinopeptides. So the function is <clears throat> subsequently linked to platelet plug formation due to the vasoconstrictive effects of thromboxin A2. It is usually more pronounced in vessels with medial smooth muscles and is independent of local contraction of muscles. And also, <clears throat> excuse me, the extent of vasoconstriction depends on the degree of vessel injury. So as mentioned earlier, um, it depends on the amount or extent of damage to the vascular endothelium. So in cases of massive the damage, then vascular constriction may not be enough to conceal or repair the damage. Okay, so next one, we have the platelets. Platelets are nucleated fragments of your megakaryocytes. The normal values range from 150,000 to 400,000 per microliter of blood. And the lifespan ranges between 7 to 10 days. So you have to be familiar also, I'm sure um, you're familiar with the, the function of the platelets. First is for the formation of hemostatic plug. And also it contributes to the formation of thrombin. You also have to bear in mind that 30% of platelets are sequestered in the spleen. So normally. Let's go to platelet plug formation. So upon injury, the subendothelial glycogen is exposed. On the subendothelial glycogen is the VWF or your von Willebrand factor molecule, which will um, allow the adhesion of the platelet through binding to its GP1B9 or 5 on platelet membrane. So we have you know, von Willebrand factor or VWF. So be familiar with their functions. The following adhesion platelet initiate a release uh, reaction causing the activation of the platelet itself and the surrounding platelet. And then the release of these substances, we have the ADP and serotonin and also the thromboxin A2. These substances allow activation of platelets causing platelet aggregation. So please remember also ADP, thromboxin A2, and serotonin or your 5-HT. In the second wave of platelet aggregation, a release of reaction occurs in which several substances induces, um, including ADP, calcium, serotonin, thromboxin A2, and alpha granule proteins are discharged. So we have. And then following that, platelet plug is strengthened further by the binding of GP2B or 3A on platelets, a membrane, and the plasma fibrinogen interspersed between the platelet plug, resulting to further compaction of the plug. So it, it makes the, the plug more stable. So next, platelet may contribute to activation of extrinsic pathway of coagulation. So remember, it's the extrinsic pathway of coagulation. So as a consequence of the release reaction, the platelet activation causes alteration in the platelet phospholipids that allows calcium and clotting factors to bind to platelet surface. So the activated platelet contains platelet factor three, which may function as a tissue um, factor. So we have here thrombin, Prothrombin, sorry, prothrombin is cleaved to thrombin, which will um, also cleave fibrinogen to fibrin. So we have here the fibrin. So please take note of the um, function of the fibrin. So let's go now to coagulation. So actually, this is a on the long, but you have to. Um, take note lang of the of the important events. No? So coagulation is defined as a complex interplay 
and combination of interaction between platelets, endothelium, and multiple circulating or membrane-bound coagulation factors. So the coagulation cascade has traditionally been depicted as two possible pathways converging into a single common pathway. And while this pathway reflects the basic process and sequences that lead to the formation of a clot, the numerous feedback loops in the cellular inter interplay and platelet functions are not included. So here we have the intrinsic pathway and the extrinsic pathway. We go first to the intrinsic pathway. The intrinsic pathway begins with the activation of factor 12 that subsequently activates factor 11, 9, and 8. So in this pathway, each of the primary factors is intrinsic to the circulating plasma, whereby um, no surface is required to initiate the process. That's why it is called intrinsic. The extrinsic pathway naman, the tissue factor or TF is released or exposed on the surface of the endothelium, binding to circulating factor 7, facilitating the activation to factor 7a or the activation of factor 7. So each of these pathways continues on to a common sequence that begins with the activation of factor 10 to activated factor 10 in the presence of activated factor 8. So, so this one. Okay, let's go back first. So subsequently, no, to add lang, um, activated factor 10 with the help of factor 5, activated factor 5 uh, converts factor 2, which is your prothrombin, to thrombin, and then factor 1, which is your fibrinogen, to fibrin. So clot formation occurs after fibrin monomers are cross-linked to polymers with the assistance of factor 13. So... So I hope um, somehow you've already seen fibrin no? either in the laboratory or in videos. So you will see that fibrin is a parang elongated na protein fiber that holds the platelet plug together to form a stable na, na plug. Okay. So this one is um, medyo damo information. So due to the complexity and dynamic nature of hemostasis, which cannot be portrayed by the classical pathway, we have the cell-based model of coagulation. So it is usually composed of three phases. So remember the three phases, we have the initiation, we have the initiation, amplification, and propagation. So right here, initiation, amplification, and propagation. So the exposure of tissue factor due to a sub-endothelial injury is the start of the initiation phase. So of course, there has to be an injury you know, before this cascade is activated. The tissue factor forms a complex to activated factor 7 to catalyze activation of factor 10 and 9, which is shown in this figure. The complex of factor 10 and 5, also known as prothrombinase, generates a small amount of thrombin from prothrombin in a calcium-dependent process. So we have to be familiar lang kung high ni calcium, or which phase no, si calcium uh, plays a role in. And during the amplification phase, Plated adherence to extracellular matrix um, of the injury, and then um, the injury becomes activated upon exposure to thrombin and stimuli. And in the propagation phase, the tennis or the factor um, 8 and 9 complex and the prothrombinase complex are assembled on the platelet surface, which leads to a large generation of thrombin and fibrin. So that's in the propagation phase. Next, we go to the conversion of iron via thrombin in a two-step cleavage. 
So very short lang. So we have previously the three phases of coagulation. And then now, after the propagation phase, which is the last phase, the thrombin leaves the membrane, on the membrane surface rather, to convert fibrinogen to fibrin by a two-step cleavage. So the steps are first, removal of fibrinopeptide A permits end-to-end -end polymerization of clot, also known as the protofibril formation. And then next step is cleavage of fibrinopeptidase B, which allows side-to-side -side polymerization of clot, also known as lateral aggregation. So please take note, we have end-to-end -end polymerization of clot and then side-to-side -side polymerization of clot. We have to differentiate if it is um, the action of fibrinopeptide A or fibrinopeptide B, not step, which step. Okay, so we have negative feedbacks to coagulation. So first, we have the active the activation of enzyme complex. Um, actually, we have to know this one because um, there should be a balance to control the, the profound bleeding and the overwhelming clot burden. So hence, there should be a mechanism that exists to prevent propagation of clot beyond the site of injury. Because with the propagation of clot beyond the site of injury, it is also um, harmful because this is the formation of a clot or a plug. So this will hinder now your effective blood flow since this will occupy the blood vessels where the, the injury is found. So we have to counter then so we have negative feedbacks to the coagulation so first is the activation of enzyme complexes first you have to be familiar with thrombomodulin so this is found in the endothelium and serves as a thrombin sink this binds with thrombin rendering it unavailable to receive fibrin fibrin fibrinogen sorry the thrombomodulin factor 2a complex also activates protein C, which inhibits factor 5 and factor 8. So you also have to know by heart the function of protein C. We have also anti-thrombin 3. This neutralizes all procoagulant serine protease and inhibits tissue factor 7A complex. So that's the first, the activation of enzyme complexes. So we also have tissue factor pathway inhibitor. So this blocks the tissue factor 7A complex and reduces production of factor 10A and 9A. Okay. So remember the, the functions of the tissue factor pathway inhibitor. So bear in mind that this will stop the propagation of the coagulation cascade. So this will serve as parang regulator Para di rin liwat niya magsobra. Okay. So we have here, no, shown tissue factor pathway inhibitor. Next is the activation of tissue plasminogen activator. So tissue plasminogen activator or TPA is released in the endothelium following injury and thrombin stimulation. This is actually uh, selective to fibrin bound plasminogen. The function of your TPA is it cleaves plasminogen to plasmin. Diba? You, you need TPA in order for uh, plasminogen to be cleaved to become your plasmin. And then we also have the activated protein C system. So this is the most potent mechanism for thrombin inhibition. So remember, protein C, unlike your thrombin and your fibrin, it is this mechanism is um, tailored to um, prevent or inhibit thrombin. So therefore, its effect or its function is opposite. I hope you are still with me, guys. Okay, so we have to remember protein C system. This is the most potent mechanism for thrombin inhibition. So parang counter-regulatory to coagulation. So the APC, or your activated protein C system, and protein S complex cleaves factor 5A and factor 7A. This 
um, system consumes plasminogen activator inhibitor 1, causing increase in activity of um, tissue plasminogen activator. So that's why in it is mentioned here, no? APC protein S complex cleaves factor 5A and factor 8A. So remember in your factor 5 laden disease, which is a uh, genetic mutation that causes factor 5 to be resistant to APC, which causes uncontrolled and prolonged activation of factor 5, which increased uh, predisposition to venous thromboembolytic event. No, so there is a mutation in factor 5. So without factor 5, so no APC system, then the, pa and then the patient will be predisposed or no, more predisposed to thromboembolytic events. Let's go now to fibrinolysis. Sorry. So we have here the steps in fibrinolysis. So please be familiar now. So fibrin clot breakdown allows restoration of blood flow during healing process. So this will also it is uh, it usually begins at the same time of clot formation. So um, at the same time with the plug formation or the clot formation also, there is already fibrinolysis. So they occur together. And fibrinolysis is usually directed by circulating kinases such as bradykinin, tissue activators, and calicrine. So the process of fibrinolysis ultimately ends up in the formation of um, fibrin degradation product or your FDP. So you have here. No, sorry. I hope you can see the, the illustration. So we have here. So fibrinolysis, we destroy the fibrin, no? Kylysis, destroy the fibrin. So this will um, produce fibrin degradation blood products, which can be measured in the blood already. Okay, so just in passing lang the test for hemostasis and coagulation. So it is important to emphasize during the evaluation of possible diseases related to hemostasis. And it is imperative to have a comprehensive and complete history of the patient, especially if um, the patient had a uh, previous history of abnormal bleeding or easy bristability, adverse drug reactions to any um, drug intake, and basic um, laboratory test results. So you have to ask that to our patient, especially during surgeries, because it will complicate the surgical procedure. So we have here the common screening tests. So we have platelet count. The normal value is 150,000 to 450,000 per microliter. Um, the associated, ma associated manifestations are the following. So it depends on the number of circulating plat platelets that are still available in the body. So when it is greater than 1 million per microliter, it is associated with bleeding and thrombotic complications already. If it is less than 50,000, um, there is increased bleeding tendencies in major OR procedures. Remember, major OR procedures. And less than 30,000, it's increased bleeding tendencies in minor OR procedures. And if it is less than 20,000, um, spontaneous hemorrhage may occur. So we have here the prothrombin time. So this measures the extrinsic and common pathway of coagulation cascade, which includes factor 1, 2, 5, and 10. Uh, the test is best suited for uh, to detect abnormal coagulation caused by vitamin K deficiency and warfarin therapy. Also, the INR determination. Okay, so we are all familiar with this. And then the activated partial thromboplastin time or APTT, which measures function of intrinsic and common pathway, which includes factors 1, 2, 5, 8, 9, 11, and 12. Okay. So patients treated with heparin are often monitored with APTT. So remember, patients uh, to monitor heparin therapy, we usually um, determine APTT. The therapeutic range is 1.5 to 2.5 times the control value. 
Okay, so these are like good to know long the obsolete test, the IV bleeding time, the reduced bleeding time, and the clotting time slide method, and the clotting time capillary tube method. And then the thromboelastography for TEG, just in passing, just good to know long. Okay, so we go now to the disorders of hemostasis. First, we start with platelet disorder. So we have congenital. Okay, so there are there are actually three of them. Oh, two. Okay, first one or the first set is abnormalities of platelet surface protein. So under which are your glands man thrombobastinia or in the textbook, it's just thrombobastinia, also known as glands man thrombobastinia. And then... Second one is your Bernard Soldier syndrome. Next is your abnormalities of platelet granules. So these are just examples, your isolated dense granule deficiency, the Hermansky Pudlak syndrome, and the Gray Platelet syndrome. Um, actually, these diseases are mild lung. And in these patients, you may give um, desmopressin acetate. No? So we go now to the acquired the acquired um, platelet disorders are um, classified into quantitative and qualitative. Actually, there is a table in your textbook naman for, for the summary. So under quantitative, we have failure of production. So usually this, these um, disorders are linked to the um, disorders of your bone marrow by failure of production. So we have under which you have leukemia, myelodysplastic syndrome, severe vitamin B12 and folate deficiency, chemotherapeutic drugs, um, any exposure to radiation, depending, of course, on the amount, no? acute ethanol intoxication, and viral infection. So actually, acquired platelet disorders are more common than inherent platelet disorders. And um, also the thrombocytopenia in acute alcohol intoxication is usually secondary to direct toxic effects of alcohol in production, survival time, and function of platelets. Also in chronic alcohol consumption, there is splenomegaly allowing sequestration of circulating platelets as well as the concomitant folate deficiency. So those are your first group. Next is um, quantitative platelet effects secondary to decreased survival. So these are the conditions. You have your heparin-induced thrombocytopenia, ITP, BIC, or disseminated intravascular coagulation. Disorders um, characterized by thrombi formation such as your TTP and HUS. Immune thrombocytopenia may be from um, idiopathic condition secondary to autoimmune disorders, um, low-grade B cell malignancies, viral infection, drugs also. So actually ITP can be found in both adults and in children. And the postulated pathophysiology is due to impaired platelet production in combination with T cell mediated destruction. So, as mentioned, ITP can be found or can occur in children and in adults. But in children, ITP is more acute or short lived and typically uh, follows a viral infection. However, in adults, ITP is. Uh, more gradual in onset and is chronic in nature and usually with no obvious identifiable cause. So the treatment for ITP is usually corticosteroid and then intravenous gamma globulin and anti-B immunoglobulin for RH positive patients. In heparin-induced thrombocytopenia, uh, there is an immunologic event where Antibodies are produced against PF4 once exposed to heparin, causing the platelet activation and endothelial dysfunction. So this is suspected when there is a decrease of platelet 
platelet five to seven days after heparin administration. Remember, uh, five to seven days after heparin administration, especially if uh, the platelet count is less than 100,000 cells per ml or there is a decrease of 50% from baseline. Okay. Sorry. So the treatment for this is discontinuation and shifting to an alter alternate anticoagulant, preferably a thrombin inhibitor. You also have your TTP. TTP is characterized by the presence of very large um, von Willebrand factor molecule, hence causing increased activation of platelets due to endothelial dysfunction. Uh, this is due to a defect of um, Adam ST13, and this is a uh, disintegrin and metalloproteinase with thrombosundin type 1. So, which cleaves von Willebrand factor molecules. It is characterized by a pentad of symptoms like your fever, thrombocytopenia, microangiopathic hemolytic anemia, neurologic impairment, and kidney dysfunction. So, that's your TPP. The treatment is usually um, for acute cases, uh, plasma exchange by FFP or your fresh frozen plasma. And for chronic cases, the use of monoclonal antibody against CD20 protein on B lymphocytes. Your HUS naman is a syndrome characterized by symptoms of that of TTP with lesser neurologic symptoms and with metalloproteinase in normal level. It is associated with infection caused by your E. coli no? or other bacteria which produces shigalite toxin. So that's your HUS or hemolytic uremic syndrome. Next one, or under still under quantitative, your sequestration. Platelet disorder secondary to sequestration. So you have portal hypertension, sar sarcoidosis, lymphoma, and Gaucher disease. So um, sarcoidosis is a disease involving abnormal collections of inflammatory cells that form lumps known as granulomata. And this disease usually begins in the lung, skin, or lymph nodes, and less commonly affected are the eyes, liver, heart, and brain. So any organ, however, can can be affected, and the signs and symptoms depend on which organ is involved. Okay. So Gaucher's disease or Gaucher disease is a genetic disorder in which glucose reside accumulates in cells and certain organs. The disorder is characterized by bruising, fatigue, anemia, low platelet count, and enlargement of the liver and spleen, and is caused by the um, hereditary deficiency of the enzyme glucocerebrosidase, which acts on glucocerebroside. So when the enzyme is defective, um, glucocerebroside accumulates, particularly in white blood cells and especially in macrophages. Okay. So we go now to qualitative platelet defects. Okay. So we have um, examples are massive blood transfusion, uremia, severe trauma, thrombocytopenia, polycythemia vera, myelofibrosis, and of course, as um, effects of drugs such as your aspirin, clopidogrel, rasogrel, peridamol, GP2B, and 3A inhibitors. Okay, so in massive blood transfusion, there is hemodilution of cellular and humoral components of hemostasis. Uh, one of the postulated reasons is the dilution of ADP or your adenosine diphosphate, which is uh, the prime substance for activation and aggregation of platelets. So if you can recall from our previous slide, so it was mentioned there that ADP is a prime substance together with uh, your thromboxin A and your serotonin. In uremic patients, uh, there is impairment of platelet function, but the reason for it is um, not clearly defined. So it is hypothesized that it may be the oversaturation of protein inhibitors in the plasma because of decreased clearance or the abnormal interaction of anemia and platelet endothelial interaction. Uh, in this case, naman, severe trauma may cause coagulopathy because of several mechanisms, but mainly uh, due to hemodilution precipitated by tissue injury. So this will be further discussed in the 
succeeding slides. So we have also coagulation factor deficiencies. So these are examples. Sorry. Okay, we have hemophilia A or uh, more commonly classic hemophilia, hemophilia B or Christmas disease, von Willebrand disease, factor 11 deficiency or hemophilia C, deficiencies of factors 2, 5, and 10, and factor 13 deficiency. So we are all familiar with hemophilia. Hemophilia A and B are both sex-linked recessive disorders. And the severity of clinical manifestation depends on the uh, percent activity of the deficient clotting factor. So it is considered severe is if there is less than 1% of the clotting factor, moderate if 1% to 5%, and mild if it is 3% to 30%. The treatment for this is provision of recombinant or pure factor 8 and factor 9 concentrates. In von Willebrand disease naman, this is the most common congenital bleeding disorder, your uh, von Willebrand disease. This is characterized by either a defect in quality or quantity of von Willebrand factor molecule. So in females, um, the most common symptom is menorrhagia. So there are three classes for your von Willebrand disease, um, type 1, type 2, and type 3. Next, the factor 9 deficiency is an uh, autosomal recessive disorder. It is common in Ashkenazi Jews, and spontaneous bleeding is rare, but uh, it may have significant bleed after surgery, trauma, or any invasive procedure. So the treatment for this is um, FFP, or your fresh frozen plasma. The deficiency in factors 2, 5, 10 are very rare. However, there is a study conducted on homo homozygotes which showed that less than 1% presented with significant bleed. Also, if uh, in factor 13 deficiency, this is also an autosomal. This is a recessive um, autosomal disorder and it was first recognized by Docker. It has an equal male to female preponderance and Acquired deficiency of this clotting factor in patients with hepatic disorder, IVD, and myeloid leukemia. So the most characteristic finding in neonates is bleeding umbilical stump. So the treatment also is FFP, cryoprecipitate, or if available, factor 13 concentrate. So we have acquired hypofibrinogenemia. So um, so under which is disseminated intravascular coagulations. And um, these are the etiologies of DIC because there can be several um, etiologies of your DIC. So your DIC is a systemic activation of coagulation pathway leading to excessive formation of microthrombi which leads to consumption of platelets and coagulation factors causing increased bleeding tendencies and microthrombi, which may also cause microvascular ischemia, causing end organ failure. So basically, in your DIC, all of your um, platelets and your coagulation factors are consumed. So the classic picture of your DIC is diffuse bleeding. So in patients with DIC, usually um, what you... Um, see in these patients is um, diffuse bleeding. So next one. So we have uh, yes, Ina. Uh, may, may additional na yan nga bago and, and virus nga COVID, they also cause the IC. In Ay. fact, that, that is one of the reasons why the patient die. Yes, Father. And for another one is the Ambuto na ka mention kadu dahin meningokoxemia. They also cause the IC. Okay, yes. proceed. Noted po, Doc. Thank you, Doc. So we have other diseases of hemostasis, your myeloproliferative disorder. So this commonly causes spontaneous thrombosis secondary to complication of polycythemia vera. The pathophysiology is increased in blood viscosity. Um, increased platelet count and increased tendency for stasis because of this one. 
um, polycythemia vera wherein your uh, blood components are elevated. So the treatment for this is low-dose aspirin, phlebotomy, and hydroxyurea. So we also have coagulopathy of liver disease. So uh, we all know that the liver plays a central role in the synthesis of coagulation factors, causing a decrease of non-endothelial derived coagulation factors. So the etiologies causing thrombocytopenia are um, here. So examples of normal in sample abnormalities are thrombocytopenia and impaired humoral coagulation. So the etiologies that uh, cause thrombocytopenia are hyperstenism, so sequestration, then reduced production of TPO, immune destruction of platelet, um, functional defect due to concomitant uremia from renal impairment. So that's your hepatorenal syndrome. So, so this is just a table lifted from, from our textbook. So table 4-3, that's your coagulation factor synthesized by the liver. So uh, I think, Ina, you have to elaborate on the table because it's, it's very info, important para mga clinical ba? They, yes. they have to understand that there are vitamin K dependent factors. And usually vitamin K is absorbed where? It's absorbed in the small intestine. So if you have a problem in the small intestine where in your vitamin K cannot be absorbed, you need to give intravenous nga vitamin K. Uh, sometimes for obstructive jaundice, wherein bile cannot flow, flow down to the, to the intestine, they develop, they develop uh, jaundice, likewise uh, prolong an era protrombin time. So this can be corrected by giving intravenous vitamin K. But for liver cirrhosis, which is intrahepatic, meaning there is a destruction of your liver cells, even though if you give a lot of amount of intravenous vitamin K, it will not improve your, your prothrombin time. That's why uh, for severe liver cirrhosis, you no longer give vitamin K. But for liver cirrhosis wherein there is still a normal functioning liver and somehow your prothrombin time is prolonged, you can give your intravenous vitamin K. Okay. But so much so, your liver also synthesizes not only the vitamin K dependent factors, and this involves your factor 8, uh, 9, 10, 12 to your plasminogen and the important here is protein C and the protein S. Okay. Your INR is equivalent to your actual prothrombin time divided by, by your control nga prothrombin time. That's your INR. Okay, continue. Yes, good, Doc. So here, Doc, as mentioned, so there is evidence that um, liver diseases may cause hypercoagulable states. So there is, um, in liver diseases especially, um, the severe ones, there is decrease in protein C and S and antithrombin 3 and plasminogen. Also, an increase in the endothelial derived factor 8 and von Willebrand factor. So this will lead now to your hypercoagulable states in patients with um, liver disease. So next, um, coagulopathy of trauma. This is the usual cause is hemodilution precipitated by tissue injury and or hemorrhagic shock. So there are three mechanisms. First is activation of protein C mediated clotting factor deactivation and endothelial injury and also auto autoheparinization. 
So these three mechanisms um, lead to hyperfibrinolysis, to also um, platelet dysfunction and shedding of endothelial heparin sulfate and chondroitin sulfate. So, traumatic brain injury also um, may induce coagulopathy of trauma through uh, consumption mechanism by the release of large amounts of thromboplastin. So that's your uh, three mechanisms. So we have the fourth one, acquired coagulation uh, inhibitors. So you have under this, you have your APAS or your antiphospholipid antibody syndrome. So APAS is more commonly seen in CLE, but may be seen in rheumatoid arthritis and Sjogren syndrome. So other inhibitors are lupus anticoagulant and anticardiolipin antibody. Okay, Ina, going back on trauma. Sige po, Doc. Going back on trauma, there is now a new new study, uh, Cascade, That's wherein good. for mild to moderate uh, trauma, bleeding, bleeding in nature, uh, they, they, uh, they have the study of giving your tranexamic acid one gram single dose. Single dose within, it should be given within the first 24 hours for mild to moderate. And they noticed that somehow an uh, bleeding mako controlled. But this is only good for mild to moderate. Uh, for severe type of trauma, they are nako controlled and tranexamic acid. Uh, your tranexamic is uh, anti-fibrinolysis drug, diba? Okay. Yes, for doc. Uh, now for children, the dosage I think is, if I'm not mistaken, 15 milligram per kilogram for less than 12 years old. Okay, continue. Okay, po. thank you for doc. So we go now to anticoagulation and bleeding. So we are all familiar with warfarin. So it is usually um, used for long-term anticoagulation in various clinical conditions such as your DVT or your deep pain thrombosis, pulmonary embolism, recurrent MI, atrial fibrillation, valvular heart disorders, prosthetic heart valves, and implants. Uh, the problem, Ina, with warfarin, Although it is very cheap, huh? warfarin is very cheap. The problem with warfarin is that we need to have constant monitoring of your prothrombin time. And I, there are oh, ito, any more reversal options. You have your reversal options for warfarin. If ever you now decide to, to have a surgical procedure. Yes, Com compared to other anti-coagulant. So, eh, so you know, thank you, Doc. So we have reversal options no, for warfarin in cases of warfarin um, toxicity. So we have vitamin K administration, plasma replacement, Cryoprecipitate and recombinant factor 7A. Uh, so there are also medications that can alter warfarin dosing. So as mentioned by Dr. Liao, actually warfarin has um parang the therapeutic index po is short lang. So very short, yeah, very short. Very short. That's why it has um several interactions with so many other drugs. So the warfarin effect is very sensitive with the concomitant administration of mga enzyme inhibitors, mga enzyme activators. So warfarin effect can be decreased and then which um, warrants increase in warfarin, re warfarin requirements. So you have to remember also that um, when warfarin is bind, no, and then eventually it will be unbound. So you will be, or you will um, see toxicity in these patients. Also, if there is increase in warfarin effect, then this warrants also 
decrease in warfarin requirements. So warfarin has several um, drug interactions, not only drug to drug, but also uh, drug to food or drug to uh, yes, uh, drug to food interactions. So there, there is any really for us to be monitoring these patients, those patients on warfarin therapy, especially on, the constant uh, monitoring. Yes, for that. So we have here, parang, these are the steps doc, in reversal, reversal of work in cases wherein we give uh, warfarin therapy. So first, if the patient presents with major bleeding or life-threatening bleeding or intracranial hemorrhage, so we administer phytonadione. So that's your vitamin K, 10 milligrams IV immediately. Then check for prothrombin time INR, fibrinogen and platelets, hemoglobin or hematocrit. Then evaluate for relative contraindications. So your contraindications, I'm sorry, but the contraindications pala are, there are relative contraindications to um, this one. So we have the PCC4 or the, um, it is marketed as K-Centra na, na brand name. So the relative contraindications to this drug is thrombotic events in the past three months, such as MI stroke, pulmonary embolism, or DVT. So in these patients, um, they will have like previous na, um, use of um, other anticoagulants. Also, another relative con contraindication is your very high risk of thrombosis, such as patient with clinical or laboratory evidence of overt DIC, coagulopathy, um, heparin-induced thrombocytopenia, high-risk thrombophilia, and APAS. So if you are able to identify these contraindications, so if yes, so we administer FFP or fresh frozen plasma. And if no, so we give um, units of the K-Centra. So depending on the, uh, depending on the INR results. Uh, probably, Ina, they might be wondering when is warfarin given for for mga patient. Kaya nung naghahatag yung warfarin. Uh, mostly, ani uh, yung indication for giving this drug is for cardiac na mga problem. Like if you have your atrial fibrillation wherein there is an erratic, erratic uh, beating of your heart, so that the blood viscosity, they really want to maupay. That's why you need to bagagin papalapsaw mo here and blood. That's why you, you give this anti anticoagulant. But there are now a lot of new anticoagulant in the market. Uh, mostly, um, the bigot run, the bigot run, but the Bigatran is, and your dosage is 100, my dear Lord, 200. One tablet, one tablet two times a day for life, huh? for life, for mga atrial fib. But the problem with the Bigatran is it is expensive. For one tablet is around 80 pesos, 88 or 80 pesos. So two times a day, baga medyo, diri na makaka palitiin in in Jollibee. So, Amwini, so these are now the indication for your anticoagulants. Continue in. Okay, Pedro. I'm sorry. So, we have mentioned this one. So this is the drug, the case center or the PCC4. So it is given depending on the level of your INR. So we have to constantly check for INR in these for, patients. For toxicity, in for toxicity. Yes, okay. So the uh, case center is the brand name, but actually it is a four-factor PCC doc. Oh. Okay. Then. We have um, direct oral anticoagulants. However, the challenge is there is no method to determine the level of anticoagulation. And also, there is difficult reversal of effects. 
So examples are um, for this one, approved uh, reversal agents, we have the idarucizumab. So reversal agents undergoing approval pa are the um, alexanet alpha or syrup parental. Pero actually, look, it is already marketed na look. This. Oh, baka na-approve naman ito in. Ito nga. Okay. Ito nga for the bigatran. If ever you are taking in this this type of anticoagulant and later on you need to have a surgi surgical procedure, uh, they need to reverse it by giving this drug. Then yeah. if it's a pie stop and, and different nga mga anticoagulant. Oh, yes. For reversal. So, Apo, Doc. So, this is in case of patients um, um, taking indirect oral anticoagulants. So, those that does not need reversal or is when your APPP is less than 1.3 times control in patient receiving heparin and when INR is less than 1.5 in patient receiving warfarin. So, your direct Oral anticoagulants include the uh, direct thrombin inhibitors and your factor 10A inhibitors. So you have your, you're more familiar with um, enoxaparin. Oh, sorry to that. And add the mm. trend to the factor 10A inhibitors. Mga low dose, yeah. Oh, but no. Pero they are uh, very expensive. Yes, yes. Okay. Uh, so see, uh, surgery should be avoided in case in CNS um, in surgeries. The drug should be stopped first. Yes, po, doc. So if emergent operation is needed, so discontinue heparin for rapid reversal, administer protamine sulfate, which is your um, antidote for heparin. For patients receiving protamine sulfate, watch out for signs of allergic reaction, especially for patients with severe fish allergies. So you watch out for hypotension, flushing, bradycardia, nausea, and vomiting. So at the transfusion. Yes, this, this is the last part. Okay, be, before I think we go to transfusion, isamarize ko lang na yan hemostasis in. So, so the reason why this topic is important, number one, is so that we, we want to prevent uh, bleeding, bleeding from whatever cause. And mostly traumatic man itong cause itong bleeding. Diba? So I'm going to and reason. We we want to stop the bleeding. That's why we, we want to study on hemostasis. And partly is because of wound healing. Wound healing for any surgical procedure, if you do an excision, minor surgery, medium surgery, or major surgery like your explore lap, you need to have your wound, wound healing. And there are phases of your wound healing. Number one is your hemostasis. Diba? That's the first phase of your wound healing. Hemostasis. And number two is your inflammatory phase. And the third is your granulation phase. And lastly, an emo an emo remodeling or your maturation phase, which usually took us mga six months to one year for your wound to heal. And this is somehow an hemocollagen matig anahiya. So these are the four phases. And now for, for hemostasis, may daliwat hiya stages. Kanina, again, mentioned mo on first slide sa dito in. So number one, there should be uh, Vasoconstriction, oh there. Vasoconstriction followed by simply pag vasoconstriction may dahiyag in re-release nga, nga enzymes. So na trigger hiya and platelet, platelet aggregation. Platelet aggregation. They go to that area wherein there is a tissue injury. And from there on, after your 
after your platelet aggregation, they develop a fibrin plug. That is your coagulation. They develop a fibrin plug through your through your extrinsic and your intrinsic pathway. And lastly, your fibrinolysis so that magkukontinue na liwat and flow han imo blood, ha blood, ha blood vessel. But this is only good for mga, mga minor injury. Now, to really control the bleeding in trauma, number one, which, which come out from the board exam, uh, the first thing to prevent uh, bleeding is to by by applying direct pressure. Tina, do not forget that. Oh, no. By applying direct pressure on the bleeding area. That's number one. Now, for mga, mga injury, uh, abdominal injury, gugti-gugti la, or even scalp injury, you can apply, you can use a fibrin glue there is now a fibrin glue that should be applied to that area para mag, mag coagulate here. then you don't need to suture that area as long as it, that, that is not actively bleeding. Okay. Now, for liver, liver nga mga injury, and you are now doing your surgery inside, you can do the Pringer maneuver. Applying your your finger on the on the hepatodudinal ligament for at least 20 minutes wherein it will control your portal portal vein and your hepatic vessels so mm -hmm. that you can do your surgery to control the bleeding on the hepatic parenchyma okay doing your pringle maneuver and if it is really severe you you can now and you cannot suture it Mga type 4 nga liver injury, you can apply several pack and you go out, you just close the skin, uh, try to resuscitate the patient, secure blood, uh, after 24 to 48 hours, you can come back again to do your re-exploration. Okay. Now, going back, Hanimo, extrinsic and intrinsic pathway. Your prothrombin time is a measure of your extrinsic, while your a APTT is a measure of your intrinsic. Okay. Now, from your prothrombin time, uh, the keyword here, I think, Ina is 19, 1972. The vitamin K yes, dependent, 1972, meaning it involves the factor one, <laughs> factor nine, factor ten, and factor seven. Factor seven is partly for your prothrombin time and partly for your APTT. APTT, and your factor one, two, and five is in the common pathway. It is found in the common pathway. For your intrinsic pathway, you have your factor 8, 8, 10, 11, 12. What in a 13, no? Okay. Oh, tama. Amo ito. 8, 10, 9. Oh, what are here? Ah, what are here? 10, ano? 8, uh, 9, 11, and 12. Because one, two, and five is a common pathway before you reach, and they need and they need calcium, calcium and vitamin K for this one. Uh, okay. So kato nakitahan blood transfusion. Okay, so this is the third part of our discussion, transfusion. So human blood replacement therapy was accepted in the late 19th century, and this was followed by the introduction of blood grouping by Landsteiner, who identified the major A, B, and O groups in 1900s, resulting in widespread use of blood products in World War I. 
So Levin and Stetson in 1939 followed with the concept of RH booking. So we have here, okay. so the serology compatibility for ABO and RH groups is established routinely. So cross-matching between the donor's red blood cells and the recipient's sera or the major cross-match is performed. RH negative recipients should be transfused only with RH negative red blood cells. So um, in emergency situations, the universal donor type O negative red blood cells and type AB plasma may be transfused to all patients. Uh, platelets do not require cross-matching due to a shortage of type AB plasma, low anti B titer type A plasma, and has become widely adopted for emergency or uncross-matched transfusion. Uh, Ina, yes, for, for universal, you have to understand it is type O and should be Rh negative. Opo, okay, because you cannot give an Rh positive to a female childbearing group. Yes, my doctor. Okay, magre-react ka, mag abo incompatibility ka later on and iabata. That's the reason why. But for male patient, you can give, kunwari na good talaga, dugo, and the, the patient is massively bleeding, you can give a type O RH positive yes, for okay. male patient. Okay. Thank you, Pag Doc. So, we have the bank whole blood. So, this had gained a particular interest as an ideal treatment for acute hemorrhagic shock. We also have the red blood cell and flows in RBC. So PRBC or packed RBC is the traditional component of choice for most clinical situations requiring resuscitation. So the shelf life of red blood cells is now 42 days. The uh, frozen or cryopreserved red blood cells have a shelf life of 10 years at negative 80 degrees Celsius with improved cellular viability and maintenance of ATP and to 3DPG concentrations. So cryopreserved red blood cells uh, required a thawing and preparation period of about 90 minutes, limiting immediate availability for emergencies. So these are the first two. Okay. I, I think, I think, Ina, they, they also need to know that itun blood is only stored for 28 days from the time it is extracted. And for RBC, it is only good for 42 days. For uh, plasma, around five days. While for platelet, mga 72 hours, 72 hours, and platelet. So these are the several type of blood, whole blood, uh, frozen RBC, frozen plasma, and platelet. Continue. We also have put the leukoreduced RBC or the washed, washed RBC. So the leukocyte reduction prevents almost all febrile non-hemolytic transfusion reactions such as your fever or rigors. The alloimmunization class 1 antigens and platelet transfusion refractories and cytomegalovirus transmission. So in most uh, Western nations, it is the standard red blood cell transfusion product. The leukoreduced RBC or the washed RBC to prevent the, the febrile or non hemolytic transfusion reactions. Next, we have the platelet concentrate. The shelf life is five days with constant agitation. So it is used for thrombocytopenia that is caused by massive blood loss and replacement with platelet-poor products. Also, it is um, used in thrombocytopenia that is caused by inadequate production and qualitative platelet disorders. So that's your platelet concentrate. Okay, next is your plasma. There are types. We have FFP or fresh frozen plasma, the liquid plasma, and the lyophilized plasma. For FFP, the storage is two years at negative 18 degrees Celsius. So this should be thawed for 30 minutes prior to use. And the thawed plasma should be used within five days. 
the liquid blast manaman, the storage is up to 26 days at 2 to 4 degrees Celsius. And the lyophilized plasma, this is um, ideal resuscitation product for patients in remote and austere environments. Um, the plasma is the usual source of the vitamin K dependent factors and the only source of factor five. And also, I think it is also present in a, in a whole blood. The plasma is also present. But, but if the whole blood uh, is stayed for mga adanahiya near, near hania expiration, uh, mostly ang mga dependent ng mga clotting factors nawawara, na, na, na di destroy. That's why it is still good to use the fresh frozen plasma. Yes. We have here the, the, the um, what are the indications for replacement of blood and its element? So first, uh, why do we um transfuse these blood products? First is to improve the oxygen carrying capacity, and second, uh, treatment of anemia. So in Apache two trial, um, it was demonstrated that maintaining hemoglobin levels between seven and nine grams per deciliter had no adverse effect on mortality. And also in AABB recommendations, the minimum threshold of 7 grams per deciliter for hemodynamically stable patients and 8 grams per deciliter for patients undergoing cardiac surgery, orthopedic surgery, and those with pre-existing cardiovascular disease. Uh, the most common indication for blood transfusion in surgical patients is the replenishment of the blood volume. So measurements of um, hemoglobin or hematocrit levels are frequently used to assess blood loss, but, but can be um, occasionally misleading in the face of acute, acute loss. So loss of blood in the operating room can be roughly evaluated by estimating the amount of blood in the wound and on the drapes, uh, weighing the sponges and quantifying blood suction from the operative field. And also... Um, in addition, uh, significant blood loss will require a balanced resuscitation, including um, red blood cells, FFP, and platelets. Okay, Ina. Bef before, the cutoff here is 10 grams. Before. Uh, likewise, the hematocrit, if it is less than 30. But uh, there is no study in vivo for hemoglobin. And hematocrit. Because sometimes, if you will see your patient uh, uh, hospital, you will see that the that the hemoglobin is around 12. But if you look at the palpebral conjunctiva, it's very pale. So this has a factor, an AB fluid, nga delusional. That's why you need to repeat it or you have to extract it on an area nga waray hiya IV fluids. So you need to correlate this clinically, the result of your hemoglobin. Do not interpret the hemoglobin result in total. You have to see the patient if the patient really need them. Because sometimes your hemoglobin is high, but the patient really need blood. Okay? This is just this is just a guide. Animo animo level of your hemoglobin. Okay, next. So we also have the damage control resuscitation or your DCR. So this is the standard for treatment of substantial dramatic hemorrhage. And the shift from the traditional is due to the discovery that plasma resuscitation has been shown to reverse in fetal injury in animal models of hemorrhagic shock, particularly by repair of the endothelial glycocalyx layer or the EGL. Okay, so there are four major components of DCR. So it is also um, grouped into two. First is the limit to limit iatrogenic insult that may exacerbate blood uh, bleed. So under which um, we have to minimize a uh, minimization of crystalloid and artificial um, colloid. And second is permissive hypotension. 
And then under promotion of hemostasis, we have balanced resuscitation with early delivery of plasma and platelet. And lastly, the use of hemostatic adjunct. For, for damage control resuscitation, there are three main main goals that you you need to you need to to have number 1 you have to prevent hypotension number 2 you have to prevent hypothermia number 3 you have to pre prevent acidosis so these are the three things so that they don't cascade into uh, disseminated intravascular coagulation and the, the, the purpose of your resuscitation is only to control the bleeding. In trauma patient, abdominal injury, you open it. If there is a perforation on the bowel, you apply two sutures just to close the perforation. If there is a blood vessel bleeding, you ligate. Then, washing the eye, you do not try to repair it uh, beautifully. Then you close. In fact, you don't close the peritoneum, you don't close the fascia, you just close the skin. Because you, you have a plan to go back again. You have a plan to go back again. And you just want to resuscitate the patient by preventing hypotension, resuscitation of your fluid. Uh, you, you give your uh, drop light to prevent hypothermia. And you do not want to reach that stage nga mag metabolic acidosis and patient. Now, permissive hypotension is, is you do not want your blood pressure to be very high. So if the initial blood pressure is around 80, you just want it to remain at 90 or 100. Diri mo na yag to 120 by giving so much volume. Because the reason behind this because bangin mag bleed utro dito sa sulod. That's why this is called as permissive hypotension. Okay, next. So under damage control resuscitation or DCR, we have a term massive transfusion. This one is defined as greater than 10 units of red blood cells in a span of 24 hours. And then we also have CAT or CAT positive status. Um, so this is defined by transfusion of three units of red blood cells within a 60-minute period. And this is additive for each additional time uh, this measure is reached. So the, the traditional definition is um, arbitrary and fails to identify many patients who truly receive large volume transfusion in a short period of time. So further promoting survival, um, so, uh, promoting survival bass. So the newer definition such as the critical administration threshold or this is your CAT, this has been um, pro prospectively validated and shown to be a superior predictor of mortality when compared to the conventional definition. So it is essential that the trauma center has an established mechanism to deliver these products quickly and in the correct amounts to these critically injured patients. So, sorry. So this one is a table from... Uh, Actually... Table for... And kuan ini in an ratio ni mga one is to one is to one. Meaning one frozen plasma, one platelet, and one cryoprecipitate or your red blood cell. One is to one is to one. Continue. So this one, as mentioned. Uh, so these are the component therapy administration during massive transfusion. So we have your FFP, the platelets and the cryoprecipitate. Okay. So also the replacement of clotting factors. This is also in the textbook doc. Yeah, this is in so the Schwartz, 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 Schwartz oh. label. Oh. Uh, so this are uh, so we have here your clotting factors from factor one down to factor 13 and also your platelets. So 
Ay, Doc, I'm uh, like this I'm is, in B. This is for ideal setting. Yes, po. But mostly ha, mga blood bank, waray kita hini. Yes, po. That's why delikado kung may daka factor 8 or factor 9 or or mga iba pa nga clotting factor so congenital or acquired you have a problem with this one kaya iwaray man kita oh. usually all, all blood ito atun and supportive treatment next so we have here your adult transfusion guidelines so We have the initial transfusion of red blood cells or RBCs. So these are actually the steps po, Doc, for um, in order for um, these patients or adult patients to be transfused with um, red blood cells. So first, you notify the blood bank immediately of urgent need for RBCs. So O negative uncross matched if available immediately as soon as possible switch to o negative for females and o positive for males so this one doc was you mentioned earlier ago. and oh, then the type uh, specific uncross matched yes. and, and uh, problem available. with the problem with hospitals in Tacloban is because we lack the the blood bank facilities to 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 segregate animal whole blood into uh, fresh frozen plasma and platelet or uh, pack rbc amo to tatong problem mostly we we rely we rely on donors blood donors in fact this morning at the gym i don't know kung nagdonate ka mo ang mga second year we we have a bloodletting this morning at gym because Uh, anaton anaton blood blood nga storage hospital mostly waray na sulod so nag bloodletting kanina even in red cross if you will notice if you go there waray lot hera mga standby na nga mga dugo we we lack a system han mga blood donors probably they are now trying to resolve this one because if ever there is a trauma patient coming in mostly it is the It is the watcher or the relative who become the donor. Mm -hmm. And remember, uh, for a donor, you need to you need to perform mga blood screening because there are disease that will be uh, transported to you. Like if you have an acquired deficiency disease, it's IB, syphilis, malaria. So these are these are mostly in the in the hepatitis is also included in the blood screening and I think this cost I don't know ina kung maabot ito yan 800 pesos ito nga blood screening then mapalit ka ng surud lanhan blood para pag pag pagkuan pag, pag then cross matching will take you around 40 minutes so in trauma patient somehow if you really need the blood you need to give a type O RS negative for mga female. And for male, kung waray nagod talaga, uh, you can give your RH positive. Okay, mostly, we are RH positive. I think, Ina, your RH positive. Kay mga 20% like RH negative. Yes, And mostly doctor. mga RH negative, mga Caucasian. Mga Caucasian, hera. But for for all of you listening right now, You you need to have your blood type kon ano ka nga kung ano, negative or positive. And I would like to advise that you have to check your families kung ano la tetera blood type because this will come in handy if ever something happens to you and you need to have a blood madali pagbiling in donor. And remember there are also religion who do not want to be to, to allow blood transfusion to occur. Ano ba itong religion na nangalimut ako? Derehiya pwede even do pill ng presente, trauma. That's why uh, we we have what we called as a blood replacement fluid. It is similar to blood but it is not blood. It is an IV fluid. Okay. Next. Okay. 
So that's for the initial transfusion of RBC. We also have for adult massive transfusion guideline. So the massive transfusion guideline or MTG should be initiated as soon as it is anticipated that the patient will require massive transfusion. So the blood bank should strive to deliver plasma, platelets, and RBCs in a one is to one is to one ratio. So this one, Doc, as you mentioned earlier. Oh, uh, if, if you are thinking that the bleeding is massive and you need to have a massive transfusion, you start with uh, fresh frozen plasma, followed by your platelet, followed by your cryoprecipitate. That's one is to one is to one ratio. To prevent the uh, massive transfusion reaction. Yes, but Next. And ideally within uh, with the first two units of transfused RBCs. So crystalloid uh, intuition should be minimized. So once the MTG is activated, the blood bank will have six RBCs. Uh, six FFP and a six pack of platelets packed in a cooler available in a cooler available for rapid transfusion. If six units of Zod FFP are not immediately available, the blood bank will issue units that are ready and notify appropriate personnel when the remainder is Zod. So every attempt should be made to obtain a one is to one is to one ratio of plasma platelets and RBCs. This is only good in an ideal setting, but for actual setting, mostly what we give our whole blood, oh, which contain the plasma, it also contains the red blood cell, and also it contains the platelet. Okay, so once initiated, the um, MT or med technologist will continue until stopped by the attending physician. So um, it should be terminated once the patient is no longer actively bleeding and then no blood components will be issued without a pickup slip with the recipient's medical record number and name and the basic laboratory test should be done immediately on the emergency department arrival and optimally performed on point of care devices and facilitating timely delivery of relevant information to the attending clinician. So these tests should be repeated as clinically um, indicated. So after each cooler products has been transfused. So this is a suggested laboratory values are CBC, INR, fibrinogen, pH, and or base deficit, and PEG if available. And then, so we go now to complications of transfusion. We have first non-hemolytic transfusion. Yes, Doc? May ano PTEG, may back, back slide. Back slide. Okay. PTEG. Si ano itong PTEG? Yeah. What's the meaning of PTEG? Electro... Uh, I'll show na lang. Here po, Doc. Thromboelastography. Ah, okay. Good. Ah, oh, ikaw. Elastography. Tromtography. Okay. For the determination of your clot formation. Sige. Waray mang kita ito. Waray, Doc. <laughs> so, first, uh -huh. hemolyt hemolytic transfusion reaction. So, this is defined as an increase in temperature of liter 1 um, degree Celsius upon initiation of transfusion. This is due to the uh, preformed cytokines in donated blood and recipient antibodies reacting with donate, donated antibodies that are postulated etiologies. So this is the uh, official. So incidence can be the reason for the fever. Yes, Madoxa, non hemolytic transfusion reaction. The incidence can be greatly reduced okay. by the use of leukocyte-reduced blood products. Then pretreatment with acetaminophen reduces the severity of the reaction. So you should be given paracetamol prior to the initiation of um, blood transfusion. And then bacterial contamination is rare. And if diagnosis of bacterial contamination is suspected, the transfusion should be terminated and do a blood culture. So emergency treatment will include oxygen. That's why your your blood your blood ina should be given for 
to 6 hours only to prevent bacterial contamination. And once yeah. mag-plug up na, diri mo na yan pwede ibalik. You have to throw it out. And once you get the blood from the laboratory, it cannot be returned back if used. Okay. And then we have allergic reactions and third respiratory complications. So we have the term here, transfusion associated circulatory overload or PACO. So it can occur with rapid infusion of blood, plasma expanders, and crystalloids. So particularly in older patients with underlying heart disease. So there is a need for us to monitor the central venous pressure. And then overload is manifested by a rise in venous pressure, dysna, and cough withdrawals heard at lung bases. So that's why in a patient that is um, who is transfused with blood, so there is a need for continuous monitoring. That's Especially why you should be very careful, Ina, for patient who had a cardiac problem, yes, who please. had a pulmonary problem who had uh, low albumin or hypoalbuminemia wherein they are giving human albumin infusion. And sometimes for patients who had surgery, they, they give total parenteral nutrition. So there are a lot of fluid that is going into the patient plus the blood. That's why most of these patients will develop this one, uh, circulatory overload or what we called as congestion na lang. They will have sudden difficulty of breathing and this is relieved by reducing the fluid and giving your diuretics of furosemide 40 milligram IBTT. Yes, Bodo. Continue. Um, so, under all respiratory complications, we have transfusion-related acute lung injury or TRALI. So this is defined as a non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema related to transfusion. So symptoms are similar to circulatory overload, however, with systemic signs of fever and rigor and the presence of bilateral pulmonary infiltrates on chest x-ray. So it is most common, uh, commonly occurs within one to two hours after the onset of transfusion, but uh, virtually always before six hours. So the treatment for this is, of course, discontinuation of any transfusion and notification of the transfusion service and pulmonary support. Next one. Yes, good. Hemolytic. Okay, so next one, we have hemolytic reaction. So under which we have acute hemolytic reaction and delayed hemolytic reaction. So acute hemolytic this is the administration of ABO incompatible blood and can be fatal in up to 6% of cases. So the causes of which include errors in the laboratory of a technical or clerical nature or the administration of the wrong blood type. So we have to be very careful. The manifestation include intravascular hemolysis, causing hem uh, hemoglobinemia and hemoglobinuria. So of course, uh, more severe na manifestation is DIC, and it can also include acute renal failure. So that's acute hemolytic reaction. For the hemolytic reaction, the manifestations include extravascular hemolysis causing anemia and indirect hyperbilirubinemia. Uh, the, ano po doc, uh, the immediate hemolytic reactions are um, characterized by intravascular destruction of red blood cells and consequent hemoglobinemia and hemoglobinuria. So as mentioned, so um, the delayed hemolytic transfusion reactions occur two to ten days after transfusion. So it is not immediately. You know. So if the patient is awake, the most common symptoms of acute transfusion reactions are pain at the site of transfusion. Um, facial flushing, and back and chest pain. Associated symptoms include fever, respiratory distress, hypotension, and tachycardia. In um, anesthetized patients, uh, diffuse bleeding and hypotension are the hallmarks. So a high index of suspicion is needed to make the diagnosis. If an immediate hemolytic transfusion reaction is suspected, um, the transfusion should be stopped immediately and 
a sample of the recipient's blood drawn and sent along with the suspected unit to the blood bank for comparison with the pre-transfusion samples. That's the end of the lecture po do. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Ina. Thank you. Thank you po do. Uh, so I think, I think the it was well discussed the hemostasis, the pathology, and mga disease congenital and acquired, and lastly the massive blood transfusion. So for tomorrow, tomorrow is Saturday. Yes, po do. Uh, ada bay Anna, Anna, are you all ready to have the quiz tomorrow? 20 questions. Regarding this topic, po, Doc? Yes, yes. May, may free time baka mo tomorrow? Or you want to have it on Monday? Um, by mo na po na starting on Monday, Doc. By monthly na, no? Yes, so, if ever itak bubuhat to na la kun ano an ano an iyo grade han by monthly hini kay you will have your by monthly na next week amo la na tin you quiz okay ba kun ana kun anon iyo grade ba didihan iyo by monthly that will be your grade for your quiz okay sige po doc okay so magdo document la kita ana I will just have to open an my... Anpo, Doc. Anpo. <laughs> oh, an. An ngayon. An. An Curtis ngayon. An Curtis. Sige, for attendance. Sige, ma screenshot ako. Okay. Open first, na lang. Open cam na lang po. Okay, first page. Second page. Third page. Fourth page. Last page. Thank you. Okay, okay thank you. And, oh, thank you. And, and, and EU by monthly for surgery is, is scheduled on Saturday. Next week, next week Saturday. Ano? Yes, po. Yes, po. Mga ano nga time? Um, check ko po the wait long. Oh, sige, Kuan, sige. Do. Um, 3 p.m. 3 p.m. 3 to 4. I-forward okay. ko na lang kan Dr. Paolo Esterninus kay Hiyaman itong chairman it's second year. Then, may da, may da baka mo schedule? May da ko pa ba, ba ibang mga lecture? <laughs> Kuwari magkatagi Dr. Esterninus sa ako ng schedule. No, no, kung may schedule ka mo, i-forward na daw laan na ako. May da ko po copy schedule, Doc. I can forward okay, it to uh, you. Uh, forward na lang ako. Thank you, thank you. Okay po, Doc. Thank, thank you, you thank you, Ina. Thank you. Thank you, Doc. Good night, Doc. Thank you, 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 Doc. Bye.